to eat, and I'm assuming that you as well. So assuming that you've eaten in a restaurant in New York City over the last five, six years, odds are you've seen these uh, gratings uh, posted outside a restaurant, A, B, and C. Right? So the city, um, they decided to basically um, make the health inspection results more transparent uh, back in 2010. A um, couple of reasons for that. One is to kind of give motivation to restaurant owners to up their game and have uh, cleaner, more hygienic operations. And at the same time, uh, provide consumers, such as myself and yourselves, with more information uh, as, as, you know, regarding which restaurants to go to and their level of uh, cleanliness. So taking that forward, I wanted to see um, how I could take the data that New York City provides us around uh, restaurant uh, health inspection results and try to you know, define um, or extrapolate certain findings regarding, for example, how does a restaurant's location affect its inspection results, or how does a restaurant's uh, type of cuisine affect its uh, inspection results. And being very selfish, uh, I would probably use some of these findings later on for my uh, restaurant selection. Um, and here are this, a couple of my personal biases, which I wanted to validate, and you know, feel free to replace these with some of yours as I go through the presentation. But I wanted to see if restaurants in Manhattan typically were cleaner than restaurants in Queens, for example. Or if uh, restaurants in Chinatown and Flushing performed worse than restaurants in the Upper East Side. Um, or if Chinese restaurants, once again, personal bias. Chinese restaurants typically have poorer hygiene than um, French or American restaurants. All right. So in order to answer this question, I looked at New York City's um, data extracts for these uh, health inspections, like I said, from 2010 to 2016. After cleaning, filtering, uh, it was basically down to about 150,000 uh, inspections, unique inspections. And these inspections happen at least once a year, but sometimes um, more frequently, depending on the grading. And um, this covers 25,000 total restaurants in the five boroughs. All right. um, before I move on, just to maybe spend 20 more seconds on the actual inspections themselves, Essentially, an inspector shows up unannounced at a restaurant, follows a checklist of items. Um, you know, are there rats running around? Um, is there salmonella? Do I have evidence of E. coli? Right. Each of those uh, violations is tagged to a number of points. They tally up the number of points, the penalties, and that's the score. Right. So the higher the score, the worse the the health of the restaurant. Um, and most people aren't aware of the score. Right. Because to keep it simple, New York City, they translate scores into grades, A, B, C, depending on ranges. Okay? So since you know, most people are, are familiar with A, B, C, I figured, all right, let's start with A, B, C. Um, so here you have the number of restaurants by borough, by grade. Um, clearly, you can see that Manhattan has the largest, whoops, has the largest um, uh, number of restaurants. So that's something we'll have to keep in mind later on as I go through the presentation to make sure that it doesn't overshadow the other boroughs. Um, but as far as the gradings, you know, most restaurants in each of the boroughs seem to have mostly A's, good, and the B and C seem to be relatively uh, proportional depending on the boroughs. Um, so right now, based on the grades themselves, it's, it's kind of hard to differentiate uh, the different boroughs' cleanliness, right? So I figure, you know what, inception number eight or nine, let's go deeper. So I figure, all right, let's look at the scores. Right, so here you see the distribution of restaurants by score, the densities, and I also um, overlay which uh, grades they corresponded to A, B, and C. So from the get-go, you can see that for the most part, they all fall within A, which we saw earlier. Um, but what's interesting here is that you know the ones with the lowest score, meaning the cleanest operations, there are relatively few. You know, they go up towards the low end of A, or I guess the high score of A, like the barrier between A and B. And from there, a huge drop and a slightly lower drop as it tails off, and there were some um, outliers. So what this tells me is that a lot of restaurants really strive to get an A because you know, they're good for their reputation, um, they pay fewer penalties, and so on. And as a consumer, I probably want to go to an A instead of a B and a C. But once they hit A, they have less incentive to really aim for you know, the gold standard. right? Uh, and part of that is probably because they're not compelled to disclose their score. Only they're great. So that was pretty interesting. Um, but regarding the differentiation by borough, they all have very similar distributions. Right? I mean, Staten Island, a little bit different there. 
but for the most part, um, pretty similar. So my hypothesis about you know neighborhoods um, being differentiated by by scores or grades, not really. Um, so you know what? I figured inception number nine or ten. Let's go deeper. So I looked at the average scores this time by zip code. All right. Now, bear in mind that a lot of the restaurants fell within the range of like 10, 10 11 um, average scores. So here I'm just distributing the zip codes by the average score, all right? Um, and as you can see, you know, there are certain areas that tend to have, um, um, you know, higher average uh, score, meaning worse uh, hygiene, so the area around Jamaica, Flushing. Um, so going back to my biases, Chinatown actually wasn't that far from the Upper East Side. Upper West Side was actually a little bit worse, um, relatively speaking, of course. So that was pretty interesting uh, to see that you know maybe they weren't differentiated at the borough level, but at, at a zip code level, you can start to see um, some differentiations. All right, but um, I don't know if you noticed, but as I was going through my presentation, I only talked about scores and grades. I didn't talk about closures. All right. So the thing is, these scores and grades they don't tie directly. Two closures. A restaurant could have a score of five, fall within A, but that one uh, violation, which earned them a score of five, that was a public health hazard, and they could be closed. So scores don't tie to um, closures directly. So I wanted to see if I could differentiate boroughs or neighborhoods or cuisines by closure. So I defined two ratios. The first being the inspection closure ratio, meaning. Um, for um, an inspection, given an inspection, what's the percentage chance that it would lead to closure of the restaurant? Okay. And the next is the repeat closure ratio. So if restaurants that close once, what are the odds that during a subsequent inspection cycle, they would be closed again? So repeat offenders, you know, not learning their lesson the first time around. Okay. So I plotted the um, different boroughs by those two um, ratios. Um, from an inspection closure ratio perspective, you know, they're pretty close, ranging from 1 to 2 percent roughly, so there is some differentiation. The uh, repeat closure ratio, there's a bigger difference though. So Brooklyn, um, I don't know who lives in Brooklyn, but pretty, you know, higher uh, reclosure ratio and relatively high inspection closure ratio. Bronx, more from the inspection closure, not from the repeat closure. And then Queens, pretty close, and Staten Island. Doing pretty well from a closure perspective. Um, anyway, so you know, looking at the closure ratio, I start to see some differentiation between between the boroughs. So I figured, all right, let's look at the other dimension of this, the cuisine. All right. So here, I, for the cuisines, um, New York City categorizes cuisines into eighty-four categories. So for simplicity, I looked at the top twenty, uh, and the top twenty cover about eighty percent of restaurants. So you know, same the inspection closure, repeat closure. The colors are the average score of the restaurants. Um, so right now you can see the scale, it's like from 8 to 13, once again, because most restaurants fall within that range anyway. Um, so okay, going back to my biases, Chinese restaurants, highest inspection closure ratio, um, average repeat closure. Uh, and you can make you know, observations about the different types of restaurants that you prefer, but um, I also wanted to point out that French restaurants were some of the types of cuisine restaurants with the lowest inspection and closure ratios. Same for repeat closure. Americans were um, well, similar from a repeat closure, of, uh, sorry, uh, from an inspection closure, a little bit higher than repeat closure. So anyway, looking at it from this perspective, you know, you can kind of see um, how different cuisines, um, you know, sit uh, against each other regarding these two dimensions. Uh, and, and once again, like you'll have this if you want to peruse at your leisure to see which restaurants you should go to or avoid. Uh, and going further deeper, sorry, we looked at closure by cuisine, closure by um, borough. I figured, all right, what about both combined? So once again, back to my own personal biases. In Manhattan, um, the restaurant, the type of cuisine with the um, high school inspection closure ratio are the Chinese restaurants, all right? But you can also observe different things, like Asian restaurants in the Bronx and Staten Island have a much higher inspection closure ratio. All right, so just uh, to conclude, um, the, the scores themselves don't 
uh, I think the, the uh, health of restaurants could be improved by having restaurants display scores and not just grades, right? More incentive. Um, I have answers to my own personal biases, but you know, like I said, uh, you have all you know the, the presentation to make your own um, decisions on whatever restaurant cuisine types or neighborhoods you'd like to frequent. And I also have um, 12 sides and appendix with a lot of other graphs where you could slice and dice whichever cuisines and neighborhoods you want to go to. That's it. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, maybe it just went over my head, but uh, what was the point of um, plotting the inspection closure ratio by the repeat closure ratio? So I wanted to I wanted to look at how the different restaurants ranked against the cuisines ranked against each other by these two dimensions. Initially, I actually had two separate plots, and I figured I might as well put them on one plot. So I'm more interested in showing how they rank against each other more so than like this related to that. Oh, I see. I mean, odds are you know if you have a higher closure ratio, odds are you have a higher repeat closure. Ratio. Yeah, so I guess that's what I'm asking. You just did you find that, or did you just plot it that way? Well, if you look at it, um, I, I found that to some extent, okay. but the main reason behind this is just to simplify you know, and reduce the number of slides I had. Okay. Right, but you could also see the kind of trend there. Yeah. Right? But that, that wasn't the main intent of it. Because, right. like I said, my initial hypotheses and my biases were around um, which neighborhoods and which cuisines were, would lead to which scores. Right? Here, in terms of closure, it's intuitive that if you close more often, odds are you, you know, the same restaurants will close more often. So from your findings, uh, what personally kind of cuisine do you eat less of? All right, so <laughs> I was um, I was planning on saying this as a joke in the beginning, but this would have this is very informative for me. But I'm Chinese and I eat anything, so I'll probably still go to the same restaurants <laughs> I already go to. All right, but it's it's good information I think to manage expectations when you're going to certain places and certain neighborhoods. How you line the labels up so that it kind of looks like it's part of the trend. <laughs> All part of the plan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> did, did you look at the mean? Because there was a there's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, I did. So it's Was there any so I, I did look at the outliers. Um hang on, there was more than I guess that was it. Yeah, I did look at the outliers, and um, I actually had other graphs. I had another graph, which was um, all the types of cuisine. I guess I forgot to put it in here, but all the types of cuisine by the two um, ratios. And you could clearly see some outliers way out into left field. Like Creole cuisine was one really bad one. So was Vietnamese. Um, but I you know, didn't include them in the previous presentation because, like I said, I just focused on the top 20 They cover... 80%, and if I were to show all 80, that would be impossible to read through. Um, but yeah. What were your findings over time? Was there any improvement? Or? Yeah, so I don't mean to cheat by having like extra slides at the end, but I figured people would be interested, so far. I just added them. Um, so this is a trend of the scores by borrow. I would ignore the beginning, probably because the government was like ramping up. They had a different standard. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, I could definitely see that happening. Um, but you could see the the average score by borrow hasn't necessarily been improving. Right? Heck, it's actually gone worse for Sign Island. Whoever lives there. Um, yeah. Another aspect of what I looked at over time was the score by month, and um, like I didn't mention this in the beginning because it wasn't part of the story. But another element that I was interested in was looking at the average score depending on the month of the year that the inspection happened in. Right? So you can see it, once again, sign line, it's kind of an outlier, but um, for most boroughs, the worst inspections happen around August. Summertime, pests, vermin, increase in business activities, and so on. I mean, that's all I looked at over time. There's a lot more you can do, obviously. Anything else? So, wonderful presentation um, and very good preparation. One thing I do want to note is 
not cheating, definitely. Uh, good tactic for any professional presentation to anticipate the questions your audience is going to. So obviously, uh, hope I had the story arc that you wanted to tell. But of course, the story arc is not necessarily complete to all the content that the data set. So you know, if you are expecting to give a 10 or 20, 30 minute presentation, you should always have an appendix ready to go, even if you might not use it. Actually, kind of under 